Hey everybody, welcome to your second set of fish notes. And this time we're gonna focus on the bony fish, otherwise known as superclass osteichthyes. So these fish, instead of having cartilage, they have a bony endoskeleton and or bony scales as well. They also have two important features that we really haven't seen in detail in other fish so far. And that's an operculum, which is a covering over the gills, and then a swim bladder, which helps to regulate buoyancy. So within this superclass, there's two major classes we're gonna talk about, and that's Sarcopterygii and Actinopterygii. So first up, Sarcopterygii. So this is really kind of the only time we're gonna talk about these fish because most fish that we know and that we think of are not in this class. They're in Actinopterygii. So within this class, the name itself means flesh fin. So these fish have like these fleshy fins and they can actually kind of move on water or on land as we'll talk about in a second, but they also use lungs for gas exchange. So examples here are lungfish, which is up here, and coelacanths, which are up here. So a lungfish, they actually live in areas of seasonal drought and they can use their lungs to breathe when the water dries up and there's no longer water for them to breathe in, they have to breathe the air. And they have something called elasmoid scales, which look like that. So they have the structure and they kind of form like a plate system on the body. Coelacanths, on the other hand, are pretty unique. So originally they were thought to have gone extinct over 65 million years ago. So except someone found one in the 30s off the coast of South Africa. Well, then in the 70s, another species was even found off the coast of Indonesia. So these are very, very, very old fish, but they are still around, much to our surprise, in the 30s. And they have something called cosmoid scales, which look like that picture down there. So these are very, very plate-like, and they protect the animal very well. So within class Actinopterygii, this name itself means ray fin. So they don't have those muscular lobes that we saw in the lungfish or the coelacanths, but they do still have that swim bladder to regulate their buoyancy. And within this, there are two major subclasses. So I know we keep breaking it down and breaking it down, but there's subclass chondroisti and then subclass neopterygii. So within that subclass, there's also two infraclasses. Don't panic yet. We'll get into them in more detail, I promise. So but let's talk about the scales. So chondroisti have something called ganoid scales, which look like that down there. They're kind of like diamonds. And then neopterygii have leptoid scales, which can either be cycloid or tenoid. Okay, so both of those are more of a circular shape. So that diversity, as promised, are two subclasses. So subclass chondroisti, these mean cartilage bone. So Fun fact about these ones, their ancestral species actually had bony skeletons, which is why they're classified in the bony fish class. However, their current living members have cartilaginous skeletons. And examples here are paddlefish and sturgeons. So this up here is a paddlefish. It's actually a very young one. They usually get very large. And then sturgeons, I don't have a picture of a full body of a sturgeon, but caviar, if you've ever had that, comes from their eggs. And as you can see here, all of this black structure you see, that's all sturgeon eggs. So they are very, very overfished because people like to eat caviar. Then you have your other subclass, which is Neopterygii, and this has within it infraclass holosti, also teleosti. So holosti means whole bone, and these are gars or bow fins like you see here and kind of they're characterized by that very long dorsal fin. And then our other infraclass teleostei means complete bone and these are 96% of modern fish. So we've kind of talked about all of the specific minor ones. Now we're gonna get into the teleos. So in terms of fish, they have lots of complex components to their body systems and how they function. So first of all, you need to know that fish have a two-chambered heart. And heart chambers are going to be something that we continuously talk about as we talk about the different vertebrates because as we get more developed, like up to mammals, for example, we're going to find animals that have larger hearts and more chambers. So it's important to remember that fish have a two-chambered heart. So kind of a simplistic system compared to what we have. Blood enters and exits the heart through a vein. 
It picks up oxygen in the gills, and then it travels throughout the rest of the body via an artery. They also have something called a countercurrent exchange system. So you get oxygen from the air, from breathing it in, but it has to get in the blood. So if you look, blood and oxygen are going to pass through the gills in opposite directions of each other. So the blood is moving this way. Sorry, I drew too many arrows. And that way, so back and forth through the gills. And then you have water that's passing over, bringing that oxygen. So it makes sure that that concentration gradient, think back to biology and moving against or with a concentration gradient, but it maintains that between the blood and the water. For that reason, it has to pass over their gills continuously. So fish always need water moving over their gills. We also have already talked about this briefly, but sharks use something called ram ventilation. So they open their mouth and they swim through the water, hence ramming water into their mouth, and that is how they pass water over their gills. Regular fish don't do that. They use a combination of their operculum and swimming to, to pass over those structures. So in terms of gill structures, there's three major components of a gill that you need to be familiar with. And we'll look at these in more detail when we dissect a fish as well. So the gill arch is this structure here. It's kind of the really only solid structure you see, and that's what provides the support for the gill. The filaments are on this side, and those are simple. They help with gas exchange. They help bring the oxygen into the body. And then you also have gill rakers, which have more space between them. And gill rakers are going to trap food, which are helpful in filter feeding. So the fish that filter feed in, they don't want that food to leave out their lung or out their gills. So they're, they want to maintain it in their body. That way they can digest it. So the gill rakers help with that process. We've also talked a little bit about buoyancy in terms of sharks, but other fish have a swim bladder. So this is how they maintain their buoyancy. So it kind of works sort of like a balloon, right? They fill it up with gas when they want to move up and they squeeze all the gas out and they want to move down. So it helps them kind of move within the water column. Sharks don't have this, so they rely on their cartilage skeleton, which is very light. They also have a very oily liver. So fish in general are oily, especially in the liver area, but sharks have an extremely oily liver. And then the ones that do have bony skeletons, they are in general less dense to help with that buoyancy. So interestingly enough, when fish are out of water, you might think, oh, they die because they're out of water, their skin dries out, whatever, you can't move, whatever you want to think about that. But the reason why they actually die is because their gill arches collapse. So if we go back to this picture here, the gill arches are that kind of structure that rely that the gills rely on to maintain their area. That way they can bring in the oxygen. So if the arches collapse and they break down, there's not all that space for gas exchange to occur anymore. So the fish actually suffocates because their gill arches collapse. Some fish, like we've talked about, have lungs so they can live in dried up areas outside of water. But for the most part, fish need to be in water to breathe. Also, Fish can suffocate in the water too. So things like red tides and algae blooms are going to use up all of the oxygen that's in the water. And then these fish also can't breathe because there's no oxygen to take into their bodies, which is why you see big mass killings of fish in areas of red tides and algae blooms. So in terms of their nervous and sensory functions, fish are actually pretty cool. So they have something called an external nair, which is located in the snot or snout, sorry, or inside their nose. And it leads to these receptors that basically tell them where they need to go. It gives them clues. So this is a prime example here is why salmon often return to the same exact stream where they were born to spawn. And salmon only do this once in their lifetime. So they remember from the smell and then they go back. Fish also have something called electroreception. So they can detect electrical fields and fish that generate these things. So this is highly, highly developed in sharks and rays. And then lastly, they have a lateral line system. So they have these pits on their skin that help detect water current changes, pressure changes, vibrations nearby. So it's, it's good in two ways. One, it helps them find prey if they're a predator fish, but two, it also helps them avoid predators if they're a prey fish. So with that being said, I wanted to briefly talk to you a little bit about electric fish. 
So electric fish have the special electric organ, very uniquely named, I know, but it has, it's in the tail. And so they have those electroreceptors near their head and they have this organ in their tail and it circulates a current. So when an object enters that field of current, the pattern changes and they're like, oh, something's nearby. So this is really common in fish species that live in murky waters. So as you even can see here, this eel, his eyes are very small. So he relies on this, this current to help find prey. Some fish also can be electroreceptive, like we talked about. They can sense this electricity, but they themselves cannot generate electricity. But examples, two common examples are electric eels, which you see pictured, and electric rays. So in terms of locomotion, fish have a very streamlined shape. If you've ever gone fishing before, they're slippery, right? When you try to take them off a hook, they can slip right out of your hand. So they do have these mucus secretions that lubricate their body to help them move through the water more easily. And then they also have something called myomeres, which are these zigzag bands of muscle. So if you like to eat fish, you may have seen something like that before. That's actually the muscle bands within the body. And 80% of this fish has these muscles for swimming. So fish are going to swim back and forth. Their tail would go that way, then that way, then that way. So they move like this, right? Imagine like a shark swimming. So in terms of reproduction, we talked in detail about shark reproduction. Fish reproduction is a little different in that a majority of fish do something called external fertilization. So as pictured over here, the female is going to lay her eggs, which are not fertilized, and then the male is going to swim over and drop his sperm over the eggs. And if they get fertilized, they'll eventually hatch. Other fish are going to release already fertilized eggs, and even some parents, interestingly enough, will brood these or hatch them inside their gills or mouth. Also important to note that most bony fish are only going to spawn once a year until they die, but like we talked about salmon, they only do it once, period, in their whole life. They spawn one time when they're around five years old, and then they die. And you can see over here is a picture of salmon that are in their spawning grounds. And then there are fish that are kind of unique in that they're diadromous. So they require marine and fresh water to complete their life cycle. So there's two types. There's anadromous and cat catadromous. The one kind moves from saltwater to freshwater to spawn. So like you, these salmon you see over here. And then the catadromous move from freshwater to saltwater to spawn. So that's very common in lampreys. Fish also do something called osmoregulation. And this is how they maintain their internal balance of salt and water. But as you can imagine, it's very different in freshwater versus saltwater. So freshwater fish, there's a higher concentration of salt in their bodies than the environment, so they only take in water when eating. They don't need to take in water. Saltwater fish, on the other hand, have a higher concentration of salt outside of the body, so they have to drink tons of water to get water, but their gills actually help remove salt from the water they drink. And then two environmental alerts I want you to be aware of. One is invasive species. So there's two very common invasive species. Lionfish are in Georgia water. So these are something very real that we deal with in the state of Georgia. And they were actually attributed to aquarium fish releases, much like other invasive species we see. People got them as pets. They didn't want them. They released them. Well, they do very well in our reefs and everything like that outside of our state and Florida because they don't really have any predators. So nothing really eats them and they have all these different fish they can eat. So they disrupt the food chain by killing the algae eating fish. So algae grows on coral, killing coral, but they also eat the prey of snapper and groupers, which are very popular food fish. So their populations are affected. And then Asian carp, and you'll see this guy that keeps getting hit in the face on this little video down here. But these are originally, they were put here on purpose, even though they're not native, but they made their way to the Mississippi River, and now they're making their way towards the Great Lakes. So if they make it into the Great Lakes, it's going to be detrimental to the fishing industry of the Great Lakes. And then lastly, the seafood industry. So seafood, everyone likes to eat fish, right? 93% though of current wild populations are fully fished or overfished. And the average American eats up to 16 pounds of fish or shellfish each year. So it's important that if you do like seafood, that you eat sustainable seafood. And there's a really cool app by the Monterey Bay Sea Aquarium. And then you also be mindful of fishing methods. So gill nets and longline fishing are terrible for sharks and other marine mammals.